This is the Into the Wilderness podcast, and if you tuned in to the last show, you'll be wondering why this one is coming out so soon after, and there is a very good reason, because the interview that I did today with Greg Dooley from NZ Hunter magazine is incredibly time-sensitive, as you're about to find out. Now, my brother is not joining me and wasn't here to record this podcast uh, as he would normally be because he is currently in Norway, uh, taking some photographs at the very start of their moose season. And I believe, by judging by some of the photos that I've already seen him post on social, that they have already been successful on day one. So I'm super excited to hear about that story. I'm sure you will all hear about it in the next podcast uh, when that comes out. But for now, we're going to be talking about tar in New Zealand and the government's recent plan to have a mass cull, uh, reducing the population to an incredibly small and and possibly not even viable level. Uh, I'm not going to talk about much in my intro here because that is the whole point of this interview with Greg, who knows what's going on there and the situation far better than I do. There will be a film coming out probably a matter of hours after this podcast is released. So do go and check out our social media, um, our Pace Brothers uh, on Facebook, and also uh, the, the podcast page that we have on Facebook, and Pace underscore Brothers on Instagram, and Modern Huntsman magazine, because it is being released in conjunction with Modern Huntsman, and that is where the film is going to be uploaded today. So keep your eyes peeled. We made this film in New Zealand two months ago, um, start of June, and I finished editing about four weeks ago, and we couldn't possibly have known when I went out to go and make this film and c- kind of deciphered the the story that I wanted to tell with the information I'd been given and what I'd learned about being in New Zealand. The film was already made basically in the format that it is now and the, the, the format that everyone's going to see with the exception of the updated information of the the current plan from the New Zealand government. So it couldn't have been better timing. It's just sad that it's under such circumstances that we were able to release this film. So please, as a podcast listener, give us some feedback when you have a chance to watch that. Don't forget that there is still a competition running as a result of the podcast from a few days ago to win a CZ doormat. All of the info for that is on our social media, so go and check that out, and you can enter, and we will announce the winner on the next podcast. So without any further delay, I bring you Greg Dooley, editor of New Zealand Hunter magazine, and the current tar situation in New Zealand. Greg, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Thanks for joining us at such short notice. I know it's evening time for you uh, in New Zealand. Now, uh, as I said to you off air, I'd love to have you on the podcast again at some point in the future. We can talk about a larger variety of topics. But for now, what everybody is talking about is the tar situation in New Zealand. Um, I want to get into the, the nitty gritty of where you guys are at now. But I think for our global listeners, what would be really useful is if you could give a little bit of context as to the history of tar, because they're not a native species there. And for a lot of people, they think, well, what's the issue with a non-native being culled in large volumes like it's being talked about right now? So a bit of the history would be really useful before we get into what's happening now. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, Byron. Yeah, well, basically, they're the Himalayan tar, which... Um Fairly obviously, they come from the Himalayas, and in their homeland, they are endangered. Um, New Zealand has got the only really decent population of tar, um, and it's pretty much the only free-range, true wild hunting experience for Himalayan tar in the world. Um, The first six were released here in 1904. They were a gift from the Duke of Bedford. They come from Woburn Abbey, and they were released at uh, the Hermitage in Mount Cook National Park, and from there, they've 
progressively spread through a large part of the Southern Alps. Um, uh, hopefully most people are aware of what a tar is. It's, it's a member of the mountain goat family, uh, one of the largest of the mountain goats. Um, they're a very big stocky animal. We call them the grizzly bear of the mountains. They're a big shaggy animal with a very um, purposeful sort of gait to them. They're the only animal other than the lion that has a mane. The bull tar has a big mane that he can puff up when he wants to show um, dominance to other males or when he's courting for females. This gives them a truly majestic look. They stand up on top of the mountains and ruffle their mane in the wind um, up against the snow. And it's just, yeah, they're a magnificent animal to see in the mountain surroundings. Yeah, I, I can uh, I can contest that having been fortunate enough, enough to spend some time with, uh, with Joseph, who I know you know, uh, only a few months ago, hunting tar in the in your mountains in New Zealand, and yeah, they are like a bear, especially when you see them walking across the snow. They are they are absolutely incredible, and I've also been fortunate enough to see them in their their native range in Nepal just sort of six months before. Uh, and the point that you make there, which I think is a very important point to for everybody to keep in mind while we're having this conversation, is that if you look at the IUCN. Uh, register for species around the world they are endangered in all of their native ranges and it, it's in the hundreds of animals that are in their nature native range not the, the thousands which as you rightly said is a viable population of what you have currently in New Zealand yeah I mean we we have a duty as far as I'm concerned or as far as hunters are concerned in New Zealand to the rest of the world to preserve a um, a a good population of these animals, so long as it's in conjunction with a healthy environment. I mean, we need to look after the vegetation here. Uh, we need to look after the alpine environment, but we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have a healthy alpine environment and a reasonable resource of these animals. And that's, and that's where the debate is at the moment. So if we, if we get to what's happened, um, well, actually, maybe if we just rewind a little bit, instead of, instead of jumping straight in at what's happened in the last week or so, can, if you could also paint a picture of the general kind of management of game and these species in New Zealand and the attitude from government and the, the organizations of authority over the last couple of decades, because it's a very different um, principles of management to what we have over here in the UK. So I think that would be a useful starting point before we get to how it's escalated now. Right, yes. I mean, simply as you said earlier, all our mammals here are introduced. All our big game animals are introduced. None of them are, are endemic or native to New Zealand. Um, so this creates some issues uh, with, with the government with, of the day. Um, there's a, a government department called the Department of Conservation that is designed well, one of its purposes is to look after um, the environment, uh, the mountains, the bush, the forests, all the indigenous vegetation and, the, and bird life of New Zealand. And nobody has any argument with that. Consequently, the minute they come across an introduced species that, that they feel is having an effect on a native species, then that introduced species is going to be in the gun. Um, the big issue we have is that they're pretty good at a brief snapshot in time. I mean, pre-human times, before the Māori came to New Zealand, there was a lot of moa, many species of moa, which are a large bird, sort of the size, of somewhere between an emu and an ostrich, depending on the particular um, species of moa, and they browsed all over the country. When the Māoris came here, they very quickly wiped them out. Um, they ate them, basically, and killed them in large numbers. And... Consequently, we don't have that large uh, population of large-sized birds that are browsing on the vegetation. So then in a few hundred years, the vegetation all grew like hell. Uh, Europeans came along, and now these days we're trying to sort of look at the vegetation, and, and you know, some people are saying that what it's like pre-European times, just pre-European pre times, but post the mower, is what it should be like. And they're trying to return it back to that snapshot in time which isn't fair, um, and we'll never get there anyway. I mean, the whole the country's full of introduced animals now. We can't get rid of probably any of them, even if we tried. It's a matter of trying to manage the valued introduced animals in a balance with their environment. We don't want to lose any more native species, to be sure, 
but we can have our cake and eat it too. We can have a viable population of some of these introduced animals, the ones that are valued, the big game animals in particular, and in conjunction with a healthy environment, a healthy environment and healthy vegetation. So that's the issue we've got. We've got a government department um, that under statute is supposed to get rid of introduced species. All our big game animals are classed as introduced species for a long time, from about 1930 through to about the late 1977, I think it was, when the Wild Animal Control Act came in. They were classed as actual pests. Um, now they have a different designation. They're called wild animals. It's really just a different name. There's not uh, not really a hell of a lot of other change. The government departments are still largely, if possible, trying to er eradicate most of the big game animals out of New Zealand. Uh, we've never been allowed to manage them. Hunters have always wanted to manage these animals in conjunction with the environment, a healthy environment. Um, we've had, depending on the government of the day, we've had localised winds where basically we get the department to back off and the Wapiti area, um, which is the... North American elk introduced into New Zealand, also in the very early 1900s. Uh, they live in an area of Fjordland in southern South Island, and that area, the Wapiti are managed by the Fjordland Wapiti Foundation. So that's actually the hunters managing the Wapiti for hunting. And to do so, they have to keep the herd down. They have to cull the herd fairly heavily to keep a low population of high quality animals. But that's what we all want. That works for both the hunters, it keeps the vegetation growing well, and if the vegetation's growing well, then we get wonderful animals and good trophies. So that's the only example of game animal management in New Zealand that's it's it's not it's actually against the law. <laughs> that's in a national park, and under the National Parks Act, they're an introduced animal and therefore they should be uh, eradicated according to the National Parks Act. But we've got an understanding down there, it's been going well for long enough at no cost to the taxpayer that yeah, basically, the Department of Conservation is living with that management system going down there. And we would love to get that management system going through for quite a few of our big game animal species, and in particular the Himalayan tar. But we've got a new Minister of Conservation who is ex-Green Party. Um, she's an extreme eco-fundamentalist, to put it bluntly. All introduced animals should be wiped out of New Zealand as far as she's concerned. And the Himalayan tar has been number one on her list from her days as a field officer in Forest and Bird, which are an extreme environmental organisation. And she's always publicly stated she wants to eradicate tar out of the country. She is now the Minister of Conservation in charge of the Department of Conservation. And she's now flexing her muscles. She sees that now is the opportunity for her to to try and reach her long-held dream of eradicating tar out of New Zealand. And she wants to do this for what reason? What is the reason that they've given it? Is it just purely because of native habitat damage? Yes, that's the one they always throw out, is, is you know damage of the native ecosystems. But in all these things, um, I've had a few radio interviews today and TV interviews and things. It's a, they, they always paint it, the picture that any browsers is bad. You know, these things are eating our plants. Well, you know, plants evolve to be eaten. We mow our lawns and they still grow back. Um, all our plants in New Zealand evolved under a heavy browse, but it was by birds. It wasn't by mammals. Um, and all those large birds, to a large extent, have died out. And we've replaced them to a certain extent with mammals. Now, I'm not saying they, gra they browse and graze exactly the same way, but there is certainly some crossover there. And there's no need to... Um, exterminate animals just because they eat a plant. The plant will grow back. It's designed to grow back. In fact, a lot of these plants rely on browsing and grazing to spread their seed. Yeah, uh, and anybody, um, our our core listenership in the UK will be frowning at what you're saying here because there is a very general understanding of the management of our our big game, which is our deer species and our red deer species, that it's uh, the vast majority of the populations are, are managed populations where you're looking at, at the offtake every year to create a balance and they do habitat assessments so they can work out in an area okay well you know what last year there probably was too many deer in this area over the period of the last two or three years so let's take a few more out this year because they've got habitat assessments to show this um, it's not a, an overall there are areas where they say okay we we need to protect this particular area because it might be natural regeneration of uh, some of our 
um, historic pine forests, but it's not a, a blanket wipeout of deer across an entire country, <laughs> which uh, which is the equivalent equivalent of your tar. But if we get to what has really catalyzed everybody in the last couple of days and what we've seen on social media and get into the numbers of what they're trying to achieve and what what your minister is trying to achieve, just run through that with me and where we are today. Okay, so basically our Department of Conservation has to consult with interested parties before it makes any major changes to anything to do with public land. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple rule. Um, and so when dealing with a native, uh, sorry, an introduced species like this, even though uh, they could say they, under statute, are allowed to eradicate them, they still have to consult. So two weeks ago, they had a meeting with the Ta Liaison Group. Now, we used to have regular meetings with the Department of Conservation. We used to all sit down. This is all the representatives around the hunting, commercial hunters, recreational hunters, and work out a plan, have a a look at the science we had at the time of numbers, hotspots, and decide whether we needed to cull some tar or whether we're going to do recreational hunter culls, targeting them into the areas where there was too many and try and shoot some females. About three years ago, the Department of Conservation stopped all those liaison group meetings. They've been going it alone for the last three years. Then suddenly, out of the blue, two weeks ago, they tried to call a liaison group meeting again, which immediately had us somewhat concerned. Uh, So they had the meeting said that the minister had told them she was going to get amongst the tar. There's the old Himalayan tar control plan from 1993 that has a a limit of 10,000 in it, or as a guideline number of 10,000. And the minister said that she wanted to get back to that number. They've done some recent science over the last couple of years, very much preliminary science, that came up with a population of 35,000 tar. But the margin for error of this science was it was anywhere between 17,000 and 53,000 or thereabouts. So they chose the middle ground of 35, but they had a 95% margin of error that it could be actually 17,000. So it was far from statistically sound science. And she decided that 35,000 was what the science said it might be. The old Himalayan tar plan said 10,000 was what it was supposed to be. So therefore she was going to kill 25,000 tar. So we have the meeting. We're told this is what she wants to do. We say, well, this is ludicrous. Um, that's gonna, not going to leave us a hunting resource. When the Himalayan tar control plan was done in 1993, the tar were just coming off the back of near eradication in New Zealand anyway, with the, the wild venison recovery industry hunting them almost to extinction. The population was way below 10,000. And we needed, we were coming out of the back of a moratorium where you weren't allowed to hunt tar. And so they were come, we were looking at going forward, trying to set some sort of a number, a guesstimate number for what a population might be that would be suitable for the Southern Alps. And then part of that plan was the Department of Conservation was supposed to re- review that plan five years later. So that should have been 1998. They were supposed to review the plan. We're now 25 years later. Docs never reviewed the plan. They've never used the plan before until suddenly this minister who has got a history of wanting tar eradicated has looked at the plan and thought, aha, now I can have a go at this. So she's grabbed the plan, it's law, and she's got the science, which is pretty dodgy to say there might be 35,000. So she's going to have a go at trying to get that back down inside those 10,000 tar and that 10,000 population number. So on Tuesday of this week, they, live, they released their new control plan that said, initially, they've already just killed 3,000 tar since all their population work was done. They are going to go in and kill 10,000 tar in the next month or so, of which 3,000 are going to be bulls. Now, in the, in the last few years, they have culled no bulls. There's been some culling done, three to 5,000 tar a year, but they've all been nannies, no bulls. Because obviously nannies are the breeding unit. If you're trying to keep a population in check and you're going to have to cull a certain number, you want to cull females, not males. The males are the highly valued animals that the hunters want. That's what brings people into the country. It's what takes the recreational hunters up into the mountains. And then while they're there, they'll shoot some nannies anyway. But they need those bulls to be motivated to get in there in the first place. So for the first time in about 15 years, the department was going to shoot bulls. And they were going to shoot 3,000 out of 10,000. Now, that's 30%. 
the identifiable bulls don't make up 30% of the population. It's significantly less than that. So effectively, they were going to shoot every bull. So that's a big issue to start with. On top of that, they told all the hunting sector that they had to shoot another 7,500 tar. And if they didn't shoot those 7,500 tar by next April, then the department was going to come in and cull those as well to make up the number. And on top of that, they're going to go into Mount Cook and Westland National Parks and shoot every tar they could in those national parks to return to a zero or to try and achieve a zero density. In other words, they're trying to eradicate tar out of the Mount Cook and Westland National Parks. So if you add all those numbers up, that gets you an excess of 25, possibly 30,000 tar. According to their plan, they are going to attempt to cull inside the next 12 months. Now, when their science says the population could be anywhere between 17 and 50, if you take the lower half of that population estimate, which is exactly where it could be, just as likely as to be in the upper half, it effectively means eradication, or at the very least, leaving us with such a small herd that there's no hunting resource there, particularly when they've shot all the bulls. What they're going to do, they're going to shoot all the bulls in the national parks, and they're going to shoot 30% of the population that they cull as bulls outside the national parks, and that's more than there is bulls. So effectively, they're going to shoot all the bulls everywhere. That leaves us no hunting resource. And that's what's got us up, and it's huge for Rory over this week. Now, what does the, to the New Zealand people, um, just as recreational hunters, but also from the professional standpoint, those, those people who run guiding as a business how important is the tar we have no tar tomorrow this all goes through and it's game over ignoring the uh, the impact as an uh, an international resource which we we touched on at the very start of this podcast what does the tar mean to the new zealand people to the new zealand recreational hunter it's huge once you've hunted tar in that environment you get hooked on it um it gives you the excuse. I to, know. <laughs> <laughs> it gives you the excuse to get as far back and as high up those mountains as you possibly can, because wherever you get to, there'll be a tar there with you somewhere, <laughs> somewhere up there if you look for them. So yeah, they're a really iconic species. Um, they are the most cliff-hanging animals I've ever seen. They can run around places that you wouldn't even consider. You know, a lot of climbers wouldn't even consider it. They are got a, absolutely no fear of heights. Um, so. The, the trophy aspect of them, they are the most magnificent trophy, the bulls with that magnificent big mane and, and those impo imposing horns with the growth rings and that real gnarly look to them. Um, Meat-wise, they're a fantastic meat resource. They're like a cross, we describe them as a cross between venison and mutton. So I'm not sure if you know what mutton is, you might call that lamb. But um, So they're, they're an incredibly good meat resource, shooting the younger animals or just the nannies. And the bulls out, outside the rut. And the rut, they're not the greatest to, to eat. But outside the rut, all of the tar, even to when they're quite old, are very, very good to eat. They're not a really strong, gamey animal like some things can be. And what about to the, the guiding community? So, well, for the guiding community, they're huge. There's, there's two animals that drag overseas hunters into New Zealand, and that is the red stag. Um, there are a lot of Americans come to New Zealand for the red stag, but number two on that list and, and not far behind is the Himalayan tar, largely because it is pretty much the only place you can hunt them freely in the world in a, in a real mountain environment. They, I think they've gotten them behind wire in places like Texas on the, on the flats, but that, that just seems like sacrilege to me. So this is the only place you can have a truly wild mountain hunt for Himalayan tar, and that draws huge numbers of overseas hunters here every year. I've been amazed at the support that you've managed to, to gain and the traction that you've managed to gain in literally a couple of days from when this announcement of this mass cull, especially the, the money that's been funneled into the, uh, I think it's the Tar Foundation, uh, the New Zealand Tar Foundation. Uh, how, could talk me through this, what you've been involved in personally in the last few days and what it's been like being swept up in this. Okay, so, so when this blew up, we thought, well, if, I mean, the only way we've ever got anywhere with the Department of Conservation in the past in a situation like this where they've refused to consult and they haven't done their job under their own rules is to take them to court. We go for a court injunction, we go for a judicial review of the, their decision or the minister's decision, and, and we've actually won. We won a case like this up in the North Island on our red deer up here um, in the, about a year ago. So we have some history with this. And we knew this case was 
um, just as black and white as that one. In fact, even worse, the consultation on this on this example was even worse than with the red deer up here. So we thought, well, we're going to need to take them to court. We need a vehicle to take them to court. Uh, we had the Lower North Island Red Deer Foundation. That's that's how we did it last time. Um, the Game Animal Council is the umbrella group that is the advisor to the minister on game animal matters in New Zealand. They are a rep they have representatives from everybody interested in game animals, from hunters, commercial hunters, recreational hunters, um, game farm hunters. All uh, uh, sorry the the game farm, the breeders of animals, all those representatives from everybody, but they are captured by statute. They are the advisors to the minister, so they cannot lobby against their own minister. So even though they were appalled that they had not been consulted as they should have been, they could not take a case against their own minister. So we needed a vehicle. We looked around. The New Zealand Tar Foundation was actually set up a few years ago under the Game Animal Council legislation to be the body to to uh, try and get a herd of special interest through. Now, the herd of special interest is, is supposed to it's supposed to be our saviour for game animals in New Zealand. We got the Game Animal Council legislation through about three or four years ago under a different government, which then allowed us to be able to designate a particular herd, a herd of special interest, and then it meant that the hunters under the Game Animal Council could manage those animals. So we got that legislation through, but this current minister came along too soon and she said under her watch there would be no herds of special interest. In fact, she would try and get rid of the Game Animal Council and she's done her best too, but she hasn't been able to, luckily. So the New Zealand Tar Foundation was set up a couple of years ago to apply for a herd of special interest in tar. It's been sitting in limbo because the minister has said there will be no herds of special interest. But because it has a good representation of everybody interested in tar, we thought, well, that's the right vehicle to run this case against the Department of Conservation and the Minister. So we kicked it back into life. Um, and a couple of us who weren't originally on the Tar Foundation but have had history with advocacy for big game and, of, and winning court cases against the Department of Conservation, we have now become an executive committee of the New Zealand Tar Foundation in the last few days. And we've been the ones who have been running this campaign um, we've started up a Facebook page for the foundation, which is which is our conduit for communication with everybody and getting the information out there. We've started up the Give a Little page, which, as you're saying, has gone absolutely ballistic, and we we haven't even run three days yet, and we've just cracked a hundred thousand dollars. I think we're well up in the record Amazing. of the most money that's ever been made on any Give a Little page anywhere. And this has happened in under three days on something that some people would say is real. Um, uh, left field, and that and that's a hunting resource, and it just goes to show how important these animals are to a hell of a lot of New Zealanders and a lot of people from overseas. A lot of donations have come in from overseas. So, since we've started the Facebook page, we've been there's been a lot of media attention on this. the The minister has been making some very misleading statements. Forest and Bird Foundation has been making some very misleading statements. So we've been trying to get back in the media and get the and get the facts out there. And we struggled for a day or so, and now we're finally starting to win the media battle as well. We've got the real numbers out there. And now we, you know, we've been on the national news and we're on radio programs all over the place. And and it's the interest in this has gone ballistic. Now we've got the media chasing us. And it's quite amazing that there's so much for Rory about an introduced animal that um and hunting, you know, which is not really sort of, a lot of people would say that's not mainstream and, and you wouldn't expect to see the public all getting up in arms about it. But it's it's because this minister's gone so much out on a lib to push her own personal agenda and the public in New Zealand don't like that sort of thing from their politicians, you know. We're supposed to be a democracy, a consensus. She has not asked what we want and she is trying to force us with our money to do what she wants. And that does not go down well in New Zealand. And she is going to pay for that one way or another, politically or monetarily, when we take them to court. I think from an international standpoint, one of the reasons beyond everything that we've talked about and the importance uh, of a species is the precedent that this could potentially set um, if the minister is successful is not one that any of us want to see because we all know that in any in name any country around the world there are pol uh, plenty of politicians in power who have very strong personal agendas and will go to whatever end they need to to try and push things like that through it doesn't have to be in hunting it can be in any aspect of life 
Uh, and it, it's an example of what can happen if you don't hold your politicians to account like you guys are doing. Absolutely. And you're 100% right. And that, and that is the thing here is that there's a, there's a sense of natural justice which has been betrayed and that's what's got everybody so upset, you know, that they they have their rules, they're supposed to consult with us, they haven't. I mean, even the Department of Conservation, to be fair, if you talk to actual work, uh, staff members in the Department of Conservation off the record, they are appalled by this decision. They don't actually want to do it. They don't want to do this massive cull of the tar and they certainly don't want to shoot the bulls but the minister is making them she's given them a directive you will shoot the bulls you will come up with a control plan that is going to annihilate the tar and so they're pretty unhappy about it as well and we've actually had donations from quite a few people in the department of conservation which we think is quite funny but that's all so you know it just goes to show you know that people have a sense of fair play and they know when things are not being done right and this is a classic example of that as you say. Just to, to wrap this up, Greg, if we, let's look f uh, forward into the future a little bit. Let, let's hope and assume that we, you managed to put press pause on this so that at least you can have some proper level-headed conversations. What would you like to, the, the, the tar management in New Zealand to look like, where hunters play a part, but that they are managed at a level where there is a balance between um, habitat damage and a sustainable population. How do you see that playing out in the future and, and, the, and the role that hunters would play in that? Well, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, all you've got to do is, we've got the vehicle with the Game Animal Council. Um, all you've got to do is sit down with everybody around the table. Doc's throwing a hell of a lot of money at the tar now, trying to kill them. I mean, the minister's given them a million dollars for this particular cull alone. Instead of spending a million dollars on culling animals they don't even know if they're there, um, what they should be doing is spending the money on really good research, really good science. The number of tar is totally irrelevant. It's the vegetation growth that is, in, is what, what matters. If you're getting satisfactory vegetation growth, then who cares how many tar there are? That's what they need to be doing, is putting their money into monitoring the vegetation, coming up with a good, robust scientific model, then sitting down with us every year with all the recreational and commercial hunter representatives and saying, right, we've split all the tar range up into what, all what they call these management units. We've got this unit here, this catchment there, this valley there, where we've got some issues. The vegetation is not growing the way we want it, and we need to go in there and reduce numbers. And in that case, what they'll do is come, or what they should be doing is come to the... To, the recreational hunters and the commercial hunters and say you guys have got first chance to go in there and reduce those numbers taking out the animals you want to take out and if you don't get enough then we'll come in and we'll do some culling down to a level an accepted level that's agreed upon by everybody and that's how it should be handled on a valley by valley catchment by catchment catchment issue by issue situation not this knee-jerk, broad brush come in and cull the whole population down, regardless whether they're causing any damage or not. Yeah, and I think uh, your your summation there is a, one that's very hard to disagree with. Uh, if people want to read more about this and support it, just remind people again where they can find all the information and, and also how they can donate if they want to get behind you guys. Okay, so yes, visit the New Zealand Tar Foundation's Facebook page. It's very simple if you look it up like that. All the information's on there. We're just keeping a continual screed of press releases and updates. We're talking to all our supporters, telling them what we need them to do. Um, you know, we've been swamping the government with um, emails, submissions, official information act requests. Um, and there's also a link on there to the Give a Little page where you can go and donate. Now, every dollar, every single dollar we get on that Give a Little page is going to get used to fight this and also hopefully work towards some sort of tar management. Ideally, what we'd like to get out of this, I mean, if we manage to halt this ridiculous cull and bring the Department of Conservation to the consultation table, then what we're hoping is to be able to get the herd of special interest underway. Because once we've got that herd of special interest, they have to work with us to manage these animals. They cannot do what they're trying to do now. So visit the New Zealand Tar Foundation's Facebook page have a look at all the information on there. There's everything you would ever want to know about tar and this issue. And then give a little on the give a little fund. Pretty pleased to help our tar in New Zealand.
Greg, the very best of luck uh, from me here. My brother is actually in another country right now. Otherwise, he would have been on this podcast as well. And he would have equally wished you the best of luck uh, from, from us at the Into the Wilderness podcast. And I'm sure all of our listeners, uh, we're going to get this out. We're not due a podcast almost for two weeks, but we're going to get this out today. So because it's obviously a very time sensitive issue, so we can let everybody know. And we will be sure to continue sharing uh, what you guys put up on social media and we encourage everybody to ha have a listen to it. at the very least go and read a bit about it and then you know make your own call from there if what we've said today isn't enough uh, but thank you very much for your time greg it's much appreciated thank you byron and thanks for all your support thank you very much for tuning in once again don't forget to hit the subscribe button on whatever podcast app it is that you use if you enjoyed that. And if for whatever reason this is the first time that you've tuned into our podcast, then there is a whole awesome back catalogue for you to go and listen to uh, with some fascinating and fantastic guests from all over the world. If this story is something that has really made you think and maybe riled up something inside you, you feel like you've got to go and act, then first of all, please share this podcast on whatever social platform uh, it is that you use. Pick up the phone, give your mate a call, tell them to go and check it out just so that they can hear about what's going on. And secondly, uh, go and find the New Zealand Tara Foundation and see if you can give some support, even if it's not financial. Just sharing this story and the information to the rest of the world is incredibly useful. Until next time, thanks for listening. Yeah.